following program on Ada Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. for joining us on this special presentation right here at Other Than the 24. Now, I wonder if you remember last time we spoke about cancer care and its climate in the medical industry at the moment. Well, tonight we're going to be touching on yet another medical topic and it's something that has not been spoken much about in Sri Lankan context as well and that's on urological health. Now, urological health does not just mean in issues relating to incontinence and issues relating to just uh, a certain gender. We have prostate cancer that falls under urological health and there's a complete plethora of issues that falls under this umbrella but we really don't see much conversation regarding it either. Well, to do exactly that, we have with us two very special individuals here on this program tonight, Dr. Chin Chong Min, specialist in urology with a special interest in cancer and incontinence based at Parkway Hospitals. Doctor, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us today. And of course, his former patient, a success story I'd like to say, Mr. Amal Piris. Thank you very much, sir, for taking the time. Well, um, thank you once again for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule to meet us here and to discuss this very timely topic and very unspoken topic uh, of urological health in Sri Lanka specifically. Well, uh, before we get into any of the specifics, I'd like to ask you, Doctor, I'd like to start off with you. Why urology? How did you get into urology and what exactly ignited any sort of passion in you relating to this aspect of urology specifically? Uh, well, I guess everybody needs to pee. That's true. <laughs> that's that's so quite true. I guess my passion is in helping people to pass urine. Well, I mean, that is a, a, quite a witty response. And I mean, at the center, that is the truth of it. Uh, but uh, well, not just yes. peeing, but yeah, there's, just quite, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's quite a lot uh, related to urology as well. Um, so we'd like to hear a little bit more in detail, uh, apart from helping people pee. Mm, how is course, it? Yeah, yeah, just joking there. You caught it. All right. So uh, basically, I like surgery, um, maybe because when I was young, I liked to sew, I do my old sewing, I stitch my buttons, I stitch the hole in my pants. So I, I think surgery just, just came naturally for me. And when we do surgery, we start, all start off as being general surgeons. And the training is in general surgery. After general surgery, um, then we start to have different fields of surgery. And I guess the kidney system, the prostate, the bladder sort of attracted me. Um, and somehow, I think it was just nice because in urology, what is important is the whole urine system flows. And it is unforgiving if you have a urine, urine leak. So in surgery, we tend to disconnect uh, organs and that has the risk of urine leak. So it's very unforgiving. And I guess that was a challenge to me. It posed as a challenge. Right. To, so it's like a pipe. Uh, maybe I'm a, I'm a plumber. Let's put it a plumber, right? A medical plumber. Yes, medical plumber. <laughs> of course. I mean. Stop the leak. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that is, uh, I mean, even if we do joke about it, it's quite important as well because it infringes on everybody's daily lives when mm. there's a, a sort of inconvenience like yes. that. Uh, I think uh, uh, some of us here in this room might like to agree that uh, urological health problems, while it's not taken that seriously, there's really quite a drastic impact in our lives on an individual level. And with that, I'd like to move to you, uh, Mr. Pierre. Could you please explain to us now what exactly, what were the symptoms that you were displaying? What was the illness that was caused in this urological area that required you to seek assistance from Dr. Min, Dr. Chin? Well, I had no complications of anything and my tests were absolutely normal. But the test that uh, goes with the prostate is a test called PSA. So when I did my PSA, my PSA was a bit high. It should be something like two to three. Yeah? Below four. Below four. Mine was ten. So my urologist, who was Dr. Anura uh, Vijayavadana, did all the tests, eliminated everything. 
I was put on antibiotics, you know, because when you have an infection uh, in your body, your PSA tends to go up. So he did everything and he said, my dear boy, I have done everything. There is only one more test I can do because I cannot find why your PSA is high. So the final test that he wanted me to do was a biopsy. So I had to do a biopsy and when I did my biopsy, the report came. Uh, seven out of nine uh, samples that they took was malignant. So it was a big question mark and uh, he said, yes, there is a problem. What do we do now? And I must be really thankful to him. He said, Amal, uh, I would like you to refer to a very good specialist who is in Singapore, who does robotic surgery, because he said, it seems that you need to have surgery. And I don't want to do this surgery, su surgery in Sri Lanka. I would like to refer you to a specialist in robotics in Singapore. And then he referred me to Dr. Chin Chong Ming. So that's how I went to Singapore. And he was also very surprised, uh, looking at my samples and said, well, how could it be no symptoms, nothing, and seven were malignant. So he was wondering whether the person who took the biopsy had gone to the same place, right? And he got some other specialist also to look at my uh, scans or whatever, and then he came to the conclusion, it's the diffused tumor, is it? Yes. Yes, it's a diffused tumor, and an aggressive one. So he said, the only thing is, to save you is to do surgery. So after you do your uh, biopsy, you need to wait for one month before you can do surgery because according to my urologist, that your prostate gets uh, in, stuck onto the skin. Rectum, to the rectum. Uh, to the rectum, okay. So therefore you had to wait for a one one month, so I came back to Sri Lanka. And after one month, I went, him, went and saw him. But before that, he did all my tests, all the scans, to make sure that it has not gone out. The bone scan is the first scan that you do. Everything was done. And then he said, well, you're lucky that it is there, but it's on the margin. And he said, if you had waited for another two, three months, it would have been, been too late. a different story altogether. So after one month I went and it was, I was not scared at all because he had his assistant and he was there and you know, every, very comfortable. Uh, and just before I was taken in, I said, doctor, do you really think that you need to operate? <laughs> I don't know whether you remember that. Yes, yes. Last yeah. minute. Huh? Last minute. Any chance? He said, no chance. <laughs> Right. So, uh, he did the operation and then uh, I stayed one night, I think, and the next day I was out. Right. Yes. Extremely efficiently. With a catheter, of course. Right. But I could walk around. So, I went and stayed in a hotel and uh, had to come and see him after one week and uh, pff, I didn't feel anything except the discomfort of having a catheter. Right. That was also strapped onto my leg and I was wearing a sarong and walking around in Singapore. <laughs> right. It was, it was quite, you know, I was uh, made very comfortable with his approach and, you know, Yes, we actually do have to, it, you know. We actually do have to get into the specifics as well when it comes to patient care, specifically in such a sensitive yes, uh, yes, jurisdiction as well. Scared at all. Not right, that's that's a very important point very, as well because very, fear, you know, fear, was not fear is something all. that really causes a yeah, lot of people no, to no. back out of yeah. uh, surgery and just yeah. any other medical uh, procedures in general. I think, doctor, that's a good uh, area for me to actually bounce back to you, especially considering now. 
there's a lot of fear, as uh, Mr. Pires mentioned. There's a lot of fear around medical procedures. Of course, it's only natural because it's unknown to certain individuals. It's not like they're well versed, uh, despite doctors being very well knowledgeable about it. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain to us now how exactly you found yourself venturing into robotic surgery, specifically in this area, because it's quite an unventured territory. Could you explain to us, doctor? Mm. Oh, yes. So I started doing uh, prostate cancer surgery by open method. That's always been the classic way of doing it. Uh, in fact, I went to Bristol, UK to learn that, uh, but it was a very bloody operation. It's not something that uh, is uh, complication free. In fact, the complication rate is very high. Blood transfusion rate, very high. So uh, I learned how to do open surgery. And in uh, 2005, the robot came to Singapore, uh, to Mount Elizabeth uh, Orchard Hospital. And I had, at the time I just came out, I had a chance to learn. And I said, okay, this is a very bloody operation. I, you don't get good outcomes, plenty of uh, complications. There must be a better way of getting the same thing done. So I went to the States to learn, um, parked myself in Irvine, at that time, uh, in the States, they had a few training centers, one of which was the University of Irvine in California. Did my training there, a mini residency course, and it was very good. You know, you really learned the, how to do it. Uh, very structured training. And uh, I could see that robotic was the future. But right. I had to come out of my comfort zone because I had learned so much of how to do the surgery open. And now I have to learn a new way of doing the same thing through right. the robot. Uh, it took some time to learn because at that time in 2005, we didn't have uh, mentors, trainers. You just go to a training center, you learn and you come back and you just perform. We also didn't have computer simulation then. At that time, the robotic uh, was just was still was new. Bones. Yes, still new. I didn't have the benefit of uh, doing on a trial run on robotics on computer simulation, <coughs> which is now the trend. You know, it helps you to leapfrog your your. It's like a uh, like a dry run. You do some practice. So we just started it, and I liked it because it's so precise. And I'm really amazed how the Da Vinci robot at that time could mimic every single uh, motion of my fingers and my hands. Right. So that's what got me hooked on it. Yes, so, well, that's, that's the starting yes, point, yes. and here we are. Actually, Doctor, uh, before we move on to uh, asking about uh, Mr. Pierce's experience as well with his diagnosis and his treatment furthermore, I'd like to just ask you once again, back in 2005 and now, right now in 2024, how much of an improvement have you seen in this field? What have you seen so far? Cause, because you have been in the field for quite some time. So you, I believe you would be one of the best individuals to speak about exactly how well it has progressed so far. Mm. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, yes, so the journey with uh, robotic surgery has been a very um, uh, progressive one. Uh, I think it's just like car, you know, we all started off driving a manual car and then later on, the automated car, automatic car came in. We had a better braking system. And now you can see we even have driverless cars. Cars are getting safer. They have all the sensors to guide you in the right lane and give you all these warning signals. So same thing with the robot. So I actually grew up with the robot. So now we are into the third version. I started off with the first version. And the first version had some limitations. It was quite difficult to use it. And, but it has progressed so much. So again, that's thanks to technology, thanks to the engineers who redesigned, who were willing to improve. And this is something that we doctors need to leverage on technology. Technology actually leapfrogs your outcomes. And at the end of the day, it's the patient who benefits. Right, as long as there's no um, reluctance to use it due to you yes, know, change. Yes. Uh, 
uh, change is usually not very welcomed yes. in any uh, aspect of course yes. medical uh, medical uh, industry included mm. Um, I think that's a good area for me to actually move on to now. We're speaking about robotic surgery and even at the time that uh, you underwent surgery, Mr. Paris, uh, it, wasn't, it was an extremely new uh, in invention. It was completely, you know, revolutionizing the medical industry, especially in the neurological health field. Uh, you said you didn't feel any fear. Is that genuinely the case, uh, sir, or did you have any qualms? Absolutely, because uh, Dr. Vijayavanan told me, as he rightly said, I don't want to operate you. It, it, it's absolutely because you got Gruesome. to go from this beginning here and right through your body. You have to really open up everything and go. So it's very bloody, you know. And your recovery time is very, very long. Am I right, Tom? So he said the best is robotic surgery. He said you don't feel it. There are a few holes in you. I still have those <laughs> holes, scars, and I didn't feel anything, you know. But you see, when I see the whole video of my operation, I still have it. Yes, I give to you. Huh? You have it? Yeah. I have it. It's amazing. It's unbelievable, you know. And, uh, and uh, how he's performing inside my body and uh, how it's or, you know, how he goes operating, cutting, then uh, cauterizing and going right deep, you know, into the whole thing is there. And then finally he gets to the target. And the amazing thing is, it's taken off as if somebody is doing with your fingers. It's put into a small plastic bag. And then you take a piece of thread and you tie a knot and a, you know how we tie it's all done with By a arms, machine. you know and how it comes out it's amazing you know I mean but, and uh, I think the newest machine you used was on me the first uh, the new one the second, at, uh, yeah it's new it was new uh, but the uh, later you have got a newer version yes yes there's an improved version it should, there's yeah. version number two and now we have number three number yes. three so num number two was during that time and it was done at the latest hospital uh, uh, novena hospital uh, novena yeah. it was a brand new yeah he was the first patient on the right. new machine because they just installed it yeah. Uh, so that's completely yes. so high I, ground for fear, I, of course. I told him you are the first case there, but you're not my first patient. <laughs> he was yeah. worried. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thankfully, yeah. I would yeah. say, but... Uh, it, uh, yeah, to me, course. it's just like driving a different car, but right. an improved version car. Right, right. I think we have to talk about the improvements in the machines as well, in the hardware. Uh, but before we get into any of the discussions on the specifics about robotic surgery and also the improvements to hardware that we have seen over the years and the efficiency of this process, let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Special Presentation. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching special presentation here on Other Data 24. We were in discussion with Dr. Chin Chong Min, specialist in urology at Parkway Hospitals and his former patient, Mr. Amal Piris. Now, we just embarked on quite a significant segment where we discussed exactly uh, Mr. Piris's journey as well as your journey to the current, uh, the present moment. I think it's important for us to um, go into the patient aspect a little bit uh, in detail. Uh, so I'll start with you, Mr. Pierce. Now, I understand that there was no fear despite just how new the procedure was. You mentioned the hospital that it was carried out at was brand new. The machine was new. You were one of the first few patients, even in uh, a country as developed as Singapore. It still leaves room for some uh, doubt and some fears. So, uh, Mr. Pierce, I'd like to ask you, 
on an emotional aspect now this is a very sensitive topic as well the, like un, un, understandably of course on a biological level as well it's extremely sensitive uh, due to the uh, requirement of robotic surgery on such a sensitive area but uh, on an emotional level you know when it comes to strength emotional strength and support how was the care that you received by dr min's medical uh, dr shin's medical team and the medical team that took care of you uh, over at singapore it was absolutely excellent i must say i mean uh, novena doesn't look like an hospital it's like a five or seven star hotel including the patient rooms you know so that hospital atmosphere is not there it's such a vast place and they were quite friendly and his uh, co-doctor surgeon co surgeon and there were others and even the chief nurse and all that you know they were with me and uh, the other reason is that me being a christian and i had faith in my god and my lord which was like a strength to me and i firmly believe in that so i was like you know very calm unbelievably calm <laughs> I, i couldn't believe it you right. know and very sobering moment no no not at all not a you know i didn't have any doubt and uh, till i was taken in there and then i was placed on this yeah it uh, he will the uh, explain the uh, how it happens right actually so. uh, that's a very important point for me to move on to before we get into the as the procedure that uh, uh, mr pierce underwent of course uh, from your point of view doctor um before going into surgery what are how do you actually discuss this with your patients because of course there are certain individuals that are not too keen on getting surgery how do you discuss treatment options mm, okay good point a uh, good question uh, firstly your surgery was back in 2013 when yeah. the hospital just opened uh you're lucky you had it done then because it wasn't crowded now it's crowded <laughs> right our our this the waiting list to get on to robotics to do a robotic surgery is now one month wow. in my hospital because there's it's just taken off so many more and more people are wanting to in fact patients are asking to be done robotically right so that's how it's taken off and now we are what uh, 10 years down the road and that will be the trend the trend is is towards technologically technological based surgery right so compared to back then and compared to now just how much of an ease is there when it comes to talking patients through mm. the process yes okay so i think uh, all patients go through a journey the first emotion they get is denial cannot be me I got no symptoms how can I be having cancer so the first thing is denial secondly then they come to the acceptance right okay we have a problem i need to solve it and that's when they start doing their search and now with dr google you can search uh people claim to be experts in this and that you go to dr google everybody's on dr google so actually our challenge comes to again in surgery you need to individualize the patient number 1 what is the better what is so called best way to settle to solve you to cure in in this case is to cure because it's cancer secondly you have to address his concerns i'm sure you didn't want open surgery right because that would set you back you've heard so many horror stories so at least that helped so when i counsel patients the first thing i look at the patient i ask myself number 1 can i cure this person in front of me will he be here 10 years later 15 years later and amma looks you know you know that me you know right <laughs> not a day over so, yeah yeah I, i've know. got the second wind you know so <laughs> yeah so new lease of life you know so that brings our joy you know you you recommend something the patient of course is the first time hearing it you say oh are you sure is this the right one uh, but fortunately again with for robotic surgery the complication is so low is so low that it's because of how minimally invasive yes it's mis is keho hardly any pain as he mentioned just now the recovery is so fast and because the robot is a piece of precision machine it's not a automatic machine it doesn't go you don't press a button and it goes by itself i'm still in control it's just a interface so it helps me to do the surgery better why because of the technology the instruments the arms uh, follow my exact movements 
And I see very well, it's magnified 10 times. Even in laparoscopic surgery, which is also keyhole, the magnification is only two to three times, and it's two dimension. In robotic, it is three dimension. So with this vision, you can see so much better, you can dissect so much better, you're not struggling, you can be more precise, and that is the key to recovery. So there's only marginal room for error as well because yes, of just yes. how precise the equipment is. Yes. Uh, I think that's an important segue. It's a very good segue for us to get into the technical aspects as mm. well, Doctor. Now, we heard from um, Mr. Pierce exactly how, and he recounted his uh, viewing of his video as well. Uh, now, on a more technical aspect, of course, you being the doctor that actually performed this surgery, I believe uh, you have more jurisdiction to speak about this specific uh, aspect. Could you tell us a little bit about that entire procedure? Uh, yeah. So in this, there are some uh, for the prostate part. There's a bit. There's a few unique uh, per, uh, things to the, sur the surgery. Uh, okay. Of course, the robot is a piece of equipment. Um, I think very important is you need to have a team, the whole team, from the nurses to your assistant and all that. So the team must be in place. In other words, they everybody must know what they're doing. So my stress for you was, it was the first time, it was uh, your, your the very first case, you know. Really? Yes, yes, I, th I told you that, yeah. So being the first time in this hospital, because previously the robot was in the other hospital. So I had to um, do a bit of dry run, I had to come earlier, you didn't know that, right? I had to come earlier, check with the nurses, you have everything I want, the way I want to do it. I actually brought over one of the OT attendants, those are the people who carry you when you're asleep, from the other hospital over. Because there's a lot extra of... Extra helping hands. Yes, extra hand. You know, it's, it's a whole team. And uh, of course, I had my nurses and my usual assistant, so that made the whole thing less stressful because it's just a lot of planning in this surgery. So basically, it's still keyhole. You have to put in the camera, you have to put in all the rest of the instruments in. Uh, that is quite standard. Then you need to dock the robot. Uh, again, you can watch all these videos on YouTube, it's everywhere. And then you just have to start, just do it. Okay, now uh, actually this operation is very standardized. But what is not standardized is sometimes when you're there, there's a bit of bleeding, you know, it may get stuck to certain areas. So that's where you need to uh, do a bit of judgment variation but again with the robot with the team uh, it's less stressful and one thing about robotic surgery that's unique is you're seated you're comfortable all right so a lot of people don't a lot of people forget if your surgeon is tired he is a dangerous surgeon right just like a pilot just, if yes. a pilot doesn't get enough sleep he's not going to make the right decisions when he's in the air when he's faced with a turbulence has to be alert yes so pilots are Forced to make sure that they have enough sleep, they don't drink the night before. Same thing. So, in this surgery, because I'm seated and comfortably seated, I have a team with me. Uh, it takes away that stress, that fatigue, you know, that physical stress which surgeons undergo. So, when I did open surgery the last time, I would take like four hours, five hours. My neck would ache, you know, and when I'm struggling and I'm flustered, I get tired, I don't make the right decisions. My neck is aching, my eyes are popping out. Right. Yeah, it's so bloody, I, mean, I can't see anything. It's not minimal work. It's, yes, it's so a, a tired surgeon is a dangerous surgeon. So with robotic, the, it makes the whole surgery safer. Your operator, which is the, you know, the pilot of the whole thing, it's, he's more he's awake. Comfortable. He's, he's comfortable. He doesn't have all the aches and he's having a 3D vision. So you can do two, three cases a day. I've done two cases back to back. Why? Because I'm back not tired. Back. Yes. Right. If I were to do open surgery, I can only do one a day right. because it's going to be very, very tiring. So end of the day, it's all about patient outcomes, you know? I think that's uh, exactly patient outcomes we see, you know, successful outcomes is what matters. After all, it doesn't matter the mode that it gets to uh, as long as it can, you know, guarantee a higher success rate for the patients and a better quality of life. Um, speaking of quality of life and a higher success rate, actually in the first segment as well, we spoke about this doctor uh, regarding the open surgery. Could you tell us a little bit about exactly how robotic surgery is far greater in comparison 
person to uh, open surgery. You mentioned both uh, you and Mr. Pierce mentioned that uh, it's it's quite gruesome and there's quite a lot of uh, there's a very tedious process relating to that as well. Mm. Could you explain to us? Uh, yes. So the prostate is in a very deep organ, really really deep, and in the Asian patients, like for him, like you know. You're thinner then. <laughs> in Asian patients, we're very thin, you know, we're very skinny. So it makes it even more difficult because I cannot miniaturize my hands. My hands are it's like this size. Right. So we're using a lot of instruments. I think the main risk is you lose control of, uh, of the blood vessels. There are a lot of veins around the prostate. If you lose control of that vein, you don't see well. Uh, it gets bloody and it's very difficult to control that bleeding. In robotic, you have a Pressure, we put carbon dioxide inside, that maintains the pressure, that cuts down the bleeding. So vision is very important in this, in any surgery, in fact. So of course. we are as surgeons, you know, when we first train, we are so used to putting our hands in there. You need to feel. Alright, because that's how we are trained. But I think we need to change that mindset. More importantly than feel is vision. So the robotic again gives you that vision because of the camera system. The other thing is that uh, because you're disconnecting the prostate, you're going to join back the bladder to the urethra and you need to, it needs to be watertight. So the only way to watertight is stitching. We, we don't have glue, we don't have aids to help us. So it's purely stitching and that stitching has to be precise. And of course during the surgery itself, uh, you know, for men, we have nerves for erection. They pass beside the prostate, just behind. Those nerves are very delicate. They are very close to the prostate. You need to separate those nerves off. So with a robotic with better vision, you can spare those nerves because one of the main concerns about patients is I'm going to be impotent. And it's, it's a valid concern valid because, concern. you know, nobody likes to be impotent. Today, you, tomorrow you wake up, you can't do it. The other thing is men are not used to wearing diapers. Right. Women are. So patients don't want to be traveling with a suitcase full of diapers. Right. Yeah, we're not used to wearing pampers, diapers. It's so hot, you know, especially in Asia, you know, you know, you don't wear diapers. So with the robot, because of the stitching, everything's precise, you cause less damage during the surgery. It's always the damage that you cause during the surgery, especially if you don't see well. As long as you preserve the muscle, you preserve the length, uh, all this. So with all this, that helps to improve the recovery, the, the continence rate. So I don't have anybody who's permanently incontinent, all right? Because again, That's I'm able to, to do hear. the surgery very precisely, uh, very clear. And in fact, I'm getting patients who are recovering very fast. Uh, two weeks, three weeks. So considerably faster recovery yes, times yes. as well. Yes, that is the other concern. I always get this question, you know, doctor, I'm afraid to go for the surgery because I've heard, I know of people, I have friends who are totally incontinent. I say, no, that is, it depends who does it. And probably they were done by open method, old ways of doing things, so you cannot quote them, you know, as, as uh, it's what's going to happen to you. Right. So there is quite a significant difference between how open surgery uh, and robotic surgery actually fares well, especially in the urological aspect as well. Well, uh, we are running out of time, but uh, Mr. Pierce, I'd like to ask you, now that we spoke about the, the side effects or the you know lasting uh, consequences that could be uh, affecting via open surgery and how we can minimize that by robotic surgery, how has your quality of life been uh, sir, after the surgery? You've been uh, around... Absolutely normal. Right. Absolutely normal. And uh, I have been advising a lot of people uh, who do not do this test to find out uh, where you have any prostate problem or in time. So advice is for anybody reaching 50 that they should do once a year the PSA test. In my case, I, I didn't do it. So eventually my wife pushed me to do it and then I, I just did it and I, this is how I found out, you know. Otherwise I would have Your just chance. carried on without anything and the rest is probably history. I wouldn't have been here today. No? Always listen to the wife. Oh, <laughs> I mean, yes, somehow somebody has to push. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, of and, course. And I must say that ever since now, how many years? 2013, 
Dr. Chin's family and my family have been very, very good friends. We are like family. Anything, if I need any advice for any doctor. Perfect doctors, doctor patient relationship. And for anyone else, I would always consult him to get an opinion on another surgeon for another kind of ailment or whatever. That's actually very important to speak yeah. about as well because it's not just prostate cancer, yeah. there's incontinence, there are other uh, issues related to urological systems that we have to speak about as well. Unfortunately, we've run out of time in this segment. We will uh, touch on specifically on awareness as well and the concern in Sri Lankan populations, uh, the lack of knowledge and the lack of awareness. Before we get into any of that, let's go in for a short commercial break. You're watching Special Presentation. Stay tuned. Welcome back to special presentation on Other Than a 24. We were in discussion with Dr. Chin Chong Min, specialist in urology at Parkway Hospitals and his patient, former patient, Mr. Amal Piris. We were just in a discussion, a very deep discussion about urological health and we left off on a segment that was quite uh, informative, specifically considering the differences between open surgery and robotic surgery and how revolutionizing robotic surgery is, uh, despite the uh, unwillingness of certain populations to actually uh, partake in the surgery. Um, I think uh, since we focused a little bit on you, doctor, in the previous segment, I'd like to move back to Mr. Pieris, uh, specifically relating to health in the urological aspects, especially in Sri Lanka. We don't really see a culture uh, in Sri Lanka where you know health checks are encouraged and keeping up with doctor's appointments, even dentist appointments. We don't really see that. While in some certain nations, developed nations, we see you know there are monthly, tri-monthly checks. Um, we don't have such a climate here. Is there anything you'd like to add relating to the PSA test that you mentioned that actually led to the discovery of the uh, malignant cancer uh, in your system? Could you tell us a little bit about the awareness that you have now uh, evolved to have due to this uh, incident? Yeah, you see, historically in Sri Lanka, people do their tests regularly. For what? For cholesterol, fasting, blood sugar. Those are the standard ones. And they always, in my opinion, miss out on the important ones. One is this, then another one is doing a regular colonoscopy, which is similar, you know, prostate test. Prostate test, especially for people over 50 or starting from 50, is a must. It must be done annually, every year. So I was lucky. It happened quite by chance when I did this test, you know, which came like a rocket, you know, and then went through the process of elimination and still I didn't have any symptoms and then still I ended up having a malignant prostate. So I think my advice is all people reaching 50 should make it mandatory that they do this test every year so that that will save uh, difficult times ahead, you know. In my case, if I had done it at 50, probably I would have found it was not so much spread and treatment would have been totally different because uh, there's no uh, question of uh, operation. There are other treatment now, as I understand, like linear uh, this uh, ray treatment, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Focal treatment. We Focal have fo treatment, yeah, but yes. But another... S yeah, so, so you can prevent quite a bit. I know I have told a couple of my relations, my friends, and they were found malignant. So, but they were not to that extent, but they were, they managed to do some treatment, ray treatment, and then get out of it, you know. So, my advice is periodically do the PSA test to prevent because this is very common now in men all over the world am i right yes, Doc? yes. very common prostate cancer um, yes just to pick up on that point uh, prostate cancer is now number one in singapore but fortunately most of the cases maybe 80 percent are picked up in the early stage 
and therefore curable thanks to PSA screening. Um, we don't really push for screening, but uh, that is still the, better, the best way of picking up early. Uh, just to let you know that PSA is just a blood test. It's not perfect. In fact, majority of the high PSA are not due to cancer. Yes. It's due to infection or just a big prostate, which is also comes with age. But we notice that the risk, the chance of prostate cancer is much higher as you grow older and as your PSA is higher. So in Singapore, uh, most of our patients are picked up, they're above 65 years old. So age seems to be a risk factor here. As you know, diet is always blamed for many diseases, for most cancers. But somehow, for men, when you reach 65, there just seems to be a lot of prostate cancer cases. But fortunately in our country, yes, you know, people, there's an awareness. They go for the health screening, they do a PSA as part and parcel of it. Not only that, other tumour markers, like for colon cancer. Uh, so that has really picked up a lot of cases. Uh, and at the early stage which makes a difference. So if you had come with, say, a more advanced stage, yeah, I won't be able to offer you the surgery. You know, I'll say you probably have to go for radiotherapy and things may be different, the outcome will be different. So you can see that suffering outcomes and even cost. If you pick up a cancer at its late stage, the chemotherapy drugs are now so expensive. I've never heard of a new drug that's cheaper than the current one. It's not sustainable. Yeah, so this is it's all about, in, you know, in cancer, the drugs are getting more expensive, although maybe less side effect, but the ongoing costs of treatment, chemo for advanced cancer, is definitely going to be more than the surgery. Because we can keep now patients alive, cancer patients, even advanced cancers, alive for many, many years. The total cost is going to be much higher than a one-time surgery. The only thing about the surgery is, yes, get it done, properly, get it right the first time. And to do, do that, you need, yes, you do need the help of technology. So especially for, like, for prostate cancer or even kidney cancer. You know, kidney cancer, I use the robot for kidney cancer too. Again, better outcomes. So kidney cancer, prostate cancer, the robot is, these are the two commonest uh, robotic operations that we do to save, to cure patients, to save their lives. Um, so it's, uh, it's really a game changer. Right, it should of be course. a game changer. It, uh, considering just how revolutionary the process is as well. And as I told, as you told me, you do even partial kidney. Yes. yes. Now, sometimes they remove the kidney. So partial kidney. We've often yes, heard of that. Yes. So, um, yeah, because kidney surgery, we still have surgeons who prefer to take out the whole kidney. If you do that, you're going to have risk having kidney failure at an earlier age and that's not a nice quality of life. You'll have to deal with only one kidney for... Yes, yes. So with uh, robotic, you can do a partial uh, and you can see it the, very well. You can get nice clear margins. It's all about margins, clear margins. And uh, the cure rate is so high, almost 100%, uh, practically 100% for, for kidney cancer too. Right. And a question of curiosity, doctor. Now, when it comes to the surgeries performed, um, especially on the urological side, including kidneys as well, uh, and the renal side, where do you see the most use of robotic surgery? For which illnesses? Um, okay, so the robot is a piece of equipment uh, with its advanced technology. It's got its features. Now with the new robot, it's got more automation. Automation, I mean, for example, the, in the verse, that version I use on you, I still have to eyeball the position of the robot, the docking of the robot. Now with the latest version, it's, it's a press of a button. It lost automation. You press that button and the whole thing just aligns by itself. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing piece of technology. That's revolutionary. Yes. So the good news is that they are always improving. And now there are other robots. Other countries are making robots. China, Japan, Korea. So you do have a choice now. It's not just a monopoly. So, but the good thing is that the robots are here to stay. And it has made so much uh, difference in the outcomes. So when I see a patient in front of me, I ask myself, will you be around 10 years, 15 years in front of me? If can, and if I have a better way of doing the same thing, particularly the robotics. So robots also are being used uh, by the colorectal surgeons now, gynecological surgeons, uh, ENT, 
uh, and now general surgeon. So more and more people are using it. So it's, the latest version is, a, is white in colour. The one we had was grey colour. All I can say is not a white elephant. Right. It's going to be here to stay. The numbers are going to go up. Uh, you are going to see that it's being well used. Patients are going to benefit. And I always tell my, 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 my students, you know, this is something that you will enjoy. And you will get better at it. That's the beauty, you know, you'll get better and better uh, as you do more cases. So don't wait. If you have a chance, get on to, the, get on to it. All right, that's a very meaningful message as well, considering um, the climate in Sri Lanka and, and our viewers watching at home, they probably understand that it's not just something completely unknown and unfeared. We're not going into it blind. There's been a lot of research done and there's a lot of successful su success stories. We have Mr. Pierce here as well as proof uh, of such a success. Uh, now, we're unfortunately closing in uh, on our duration, uh, unfortunately, on this discussion. But uh, before we go in for any sort of conclusion, I'd like to ask, uh, Mr. Pierce, um, how drastically has your view on health changed after your diagnosis and after your treatment? And what can you offer? Uh, what can you tell the viewers watching at home exactly, uh, apart from taking the tests and mandatory health checkups? Uh, on on an emotional level, how did you actually go through this? And do you believe that the viewers at home will have no fear in approaching medicine as it is today? Yeah, as as I told you earlier. Uh, considering the, the traditional, the orthodox way of operating and when, when uh, my urologist, Dr. Andro Vijayavadana told me, he told me this is how it happens. So that gave me a lot of comfort. But then still I had qualms, kind of fear and you know at the beginning. So once I went and met him and you know explained, he explained everything and you know so it gradually went off and I knew I had to do it. There's no option, you know. So I would, I, I would say that my life has been the same. There's, although I went through this operation, that has not affected me at all. Because if you look in the wider sense, I mean, this is quality of life. I mean, you, you, you enjoy life despite uh, going through this kind of operation, you know. And I would like to tell the people who listen to this, you should not fear to undergo an operation when you have a confident surgeon who is backed by a lot of experience and, you know, his credentials and, you know, and then he takes care of you, you know. Otherwise, you... you will, There's trust. That's absolute trust, you know. So I think that's the advice I can give, you know, and also Singapore being such a lovely place for medical. I know a lot of Sri Lankans go there for everything. So I can recommend. It's one of our most visited countries as yeah, well. Yeah, and especially Novina was a fantastic hospital, you know. Uh, yeah. As you say, I know I, be, I went and saw you a couple of years ago. There are more people, but still it's a huge place, you know. Right, and there's and no need to fear relating to this at all. Not at, at all. all, not at all. I think, uh, well, uh, final comments, Doctor. Uh, our viewers watching at home, is there something specific you'd like to tell them uh, before we conclude this discussion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, okay, because the robot is a game changer, this, you were saying that coming to Singapore or other countries, actually in Sri Lanka, your doctors, and I was sharing with them, there is uh, an opportunity for you to get onto it. It's not too late. Because now we have a newer version, it's less, it's more automated, less of uh, eyeballing, it's got advanced features. It all comes down to buying it, the surgeons believing in it. If you don't believe in a product, you will never enjoy that, that, the benefit of that product. So if your local surgeons get on to it, and it's not just urologists, you've got other specialties. It's not just exclusive for urologists, although we're the main user. It's still not too late. Yeah. Actually, it's still not too late. You just have to get the funding, you buy it. Next comes the training. Training now, you have computer simulations, and of course, it'll be good to have a mentor, a mentor, a trainer. I didn't have that. I had learned the hard way. But now you have lots of people who are trained in it. 
it's just a matter of availing themselves and your country can be the same. Yes. You can match. Exactly. There is, a, there is hope for yes, Sri Lanka's yes, medical yes, sector yes. to and actually improve. One thing about the learning curve, you know, in every surgery there's a learning curve. Some are more difficult than others. With robotic, the learning curve is short. It's much shorter, much shorter than standard laparoscopy because in standard laparoscopy you don't have that technology to help you with the stitching, with the vision, so you're struggling away. So the trend now, open surgery, you can go straight to robotic, you can skip the laparoscopic. Although it's cheaper, but I wouldn't say it's very much cheaper because if you take a We're long time to do the surgery with complication, the total cost is going to be more. With robotic prostate, I'm quoting a, only a 1% complication rate. Only 1%? There are not many patients, and 0% zero blood, zero blood transfusion rate. Right. So that there are is not many surgeries we can give you say steps. that exactly yes. i mean of course when we say um, uh, surgery we often uh, of course expect uh, terrible recovery times and just gruesome you know having to replenish blood and having to go through an entire ordeal that itself is traumatic and what uh, mr pierce mentioned uh, that his life isn't much different before or after simply because of how swift and just how short that window of recovery was and window of surgery was it wasn't enough to leave any sort of medical trauma in anybody's head uh, and there's no fear because of just how size the machines are. Well, I believe that's a very perfect topic for us to actually uh, end off our discussion. Unfortunately, we've run out of time uh, for this discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for taking the time to enlighten our viewers and to educate our viewers on this uh, specific topic. Yes. Uh, and thank you very much, Mr. Pierce, for thank taking the time to join us uh, to actually yeah. tell us of your success uh, yeah. and how your life is after yeah. such a revolution. So uh, I would like to just make one quick point. Yes, of course. Because we have very good surgeons here. I think as Dr. Chin said, we need to bring the equipment here so that people can do it here. They don't need to go to another country. We, we have need to foster that. We excellent facilities in Sri Lanka. We need to foster that. Yes. Right. I think that's we a perfect uh, yeah. uh, comment for us to end off this discussion on. All hope is not lost for our country uh, and our medical future does look bright if we uh, intend to put in the effort uh, in actually modernizing our technologies. Well, uh, that's all we have for you here tonight on special presentation here on Other Than a 24. If you had missed this program or any of the other programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Other Than English. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great night.